Good everyone, this is Roger Chabot and welcome to the first episode of D-Day Dodgers of Canada. In this new series, we will relive the extraordinary feat of arms of the Canadians who participated in Operation Husky and the Italian campaign from 1943 to 1945. In 1944, there were a certain Lady Astor, a member of British Parliament, who had dubbed the soldiers fighting in Italy as being D-Day Dodgers. Through this series, we will show you that the Canadians who fought and died in Sicily and Italy were no Dodgers, but were formidable fighters. Today, to start our series, we are at the Canadian War Museum, where we're going to meet an expert historian who will relate to us the critical events that led to Canada's participation in the largest amphibious operation that the world had ever seen on the morning of 10 July 1943. So come with me. Well, thank you again, uh, Yasmin, for inviting us in the Canadian War Museum today. And uh, could you tell us what is the mission of the Canadian War Museum? Well, the Canadian War Museum is Canada's National Military History Museum. Here within these walls, we recount the stories um, uh, in their personal, national and international dimensions. And our role is to make sure that those stories are told and that our storied history is known. And today, I'm going to be introducing you to Dr. Jeff Noakes. Dr. Noakes is our Second World War historian, and he'll be providing you with an introduction to the Italian campaign. And here he is now. Thank you, Yasmin. My pleasure. Uh, good morning, Dr. Noakes. Welcome to the Canadian War Museum. Thank you. So, uh, man, I'm, I, I can't wait to, to hear what, everything you're going to be teaching us today. Well then, in that case, why don't we head on into the gallery? Uh, at the start of September 1939, Germany invades Poland. And in response, uh, France and Great Britain declare war on Germany on September 3rd, 1939. A week later, on September 10th, 1939, after parliamentary debate, Canada also enters the war and declares war on Germany. So unlike in 1914, when Great Britain declared war on Germany and Canada was automatically at war, in 1939, there was a separate, distinct Canadian declaration of war. At the time, the Canadian military, the permanent military, was not very large at all. There were just over 10,000 members, all told, of the Army, of the Navy, and of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, there were, of course, reserves who had been training in the interwar period, but the interwar military budgets had not been large. So as a result, Canada had to mobilize from a very small peacetime force to ultimately create a military of nearly 1.1 million people which is impressive in and of itself when you stop and remember that the Canadian population during the Second World War is around 12 million. That means that almost 10% of the Canadian population is in uniform at one point or another during the Second World War. And this is truly an impressive achievement for a country of Canada's size, starting from such a relatively uh, small 1939 military force. Well, the first Canadian division goes overseas in December of 1939, so leaves Canada, sails out of Halifax, arrives in Great Britain just as 1939 is ending. Um, and then what happens is that the 1st Canadian Division is then reinforced by more army reinforcements, and following the German um, invasion takeover of Western Europe, um, the Canadian forces that are in Great Britain are augmented even more. So the Royal Canadian Navy sends more ships to European waters. Um, the Air Force basically sends its one squadron of modern fighter aircraft overseas, which then participates in the Battle of Britain. And Canadians then form a very, part, a very important part of the garrison that's helping to protect Great Britain against the possibility of a German invasion in 1940 and 1941. Um, the first time that the Canadian Army sees combat on a large scale is actually December of 1941 at Hong Kong. Um, but the first time it sees combat on a large scale in the European theater uh, is August of 1942 at Dieppe, where Canadians form the major part of the uh, force that's landed during the Dieppe raid and suffer their single worst day casualties of the Second World War. There's more than 900 dead, 
Um, there's about 2,400 wounded and almost 2,000 of, of the Canadians there are taken uh, prisoner. And Canadians make up the largest part of the landing forces uh, at Dieppe and those who make it ashore suffer more than 60% casualties, so killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. This obviously has an effect on morale, especially on the civilian population at home. Um, but there are also bigger questions that are taking place, which is that the Canadian Army has been overseas in part since the end of 1939 and has not yet seen large-scale sustained military activities. So there are political questions and public questions about how long is the Army going to be overseas before it gets into action. But it's also an issue for the soldiers themselves as well, because they joined up because they wanted to serve. And while they understand that, yes, helping to protect Great Britain against the possibility of invasion is important, that's much less of a, of a risk than they were seeing in 1940 or 1941. And so as a result, soldiers are looking essentially for action and finding out when are they going to get it. Andrew McNaughton is commanding the Canadian Army in Great Britain at the time. And he's a First World War veteran with a distinguished service career then uh, as a gunner. And his concerns um, are several fold. So one of them is to make sure that Canadian forces stay under Canadian control, because after the experiences of the First World War, this is always a concern. And the second is that they stay together as much as possible, so that they don't go out in little penny packets here and there but that they fight and serve under Canadian command, um, but also as an identifiably Canadian force or as an identifiably Canadian element of a multinational force. A number of things happen, but most importantly, it's um, political and public pressure that uh, is politicians in Canada and members of the public uh, expecting that the Canadian Army will be seen to be in action in um, a sustained campaign against the enemy especially because recently in the news there had been news about the fighting in North Africa, for instance, against German and Italian forces there. So there is an expectation that the Canadian Army will be seen to be playing a role as part of this and will be playing a role as part of this. And so what happens then is in the next major Allied offensive against the Germans, uh, which is going to fall somewhere against Italy, uh, the Canadians come to take a part in that. So the Casablanca Conference, which takes place at the start of 1943, is a major conference where both Roosevelt, so the American president, and Churchill, the British prime minister, are in attendance. And the big decision there is where will the next major offensive against Germany take place? Because at that time, the fighting in North Africa is winding up. And so the question is where to go next? And there are a number of possible suggestions that are made. And ultimately, the leaders decide to invade Sicily. Um, both because it's a major military objective, it'll deliver a significant blow against Italy, but it's also close enough to air bases and other facilities in North Africa that there can be full and proper air coverage of the assault, which is going to be important because this is going to be one of the largest amphibious assaults in history. And so uh, they want to control the risks of enemy attacks on shipping while the invasion force is sailing into the Mediterranean and also after the invasion takes place. In January 1943, when the decision is made to invade Sicily, the Canadians don't form a major part of that. The Royal Canadian Air Force does have squadrons in North Africa, but the idea that the Canadian Army will be a part of Operation Husky isn't there yet. After the decision is made, uh, the Canadians are then chosen to participate as a result of the pressures we were talking and decisions we were talking about earlier. And so it's 1st Canadian Infantry Division and 1st Canadian Armoured Brigade that are chosen for involvement. And the commander of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division at the time is General Harry Salmon. So the challenge is that the invasion is taking place in early July, ultimately July 10th. And the Canadians have to get ready in a very short period of time. And uh, this is a lot of work. They're already well trained, but they have to undertake additional training. And so this is part of Salmon's task is to make sure that the Canadians are working as an integral part of 8th Army which is also landing, of course, alongside American forces as well. This is a multinational operation that's taking place with these landings in Sicily. What happens is one of these accidents of war that has a tremendous effect on things that happen later. 
And so Salmon and his staff are on their way by aircraft to a conference for planning um, further details of the invasion. When the aircraft crashes in the south of England in, in late April 1943, and so now to add to the complications of having to quickly get ready to take part in this invasion, they now have to find a new replacement commander for 1st Canadian Infantry Division. What they do is they look to 2nd Division and they choose um, Guy Simmons to replace Salmon. And so Simmons steps in only a couple of months before the invasion um, is set to unfold. So he has a huge task cut out for him. So this is a um, significant part of uh, complication, shall we say, of how the Canadians get involved in the landings. It's a really significant journey because, uh, for the Canadians at least, they're loading onto ships in the North United Kingdom, um, out of Scotland, and then sailing south around the United Kingdom and then into the Mediterranean be and going directly to the landing beaches. So this is a major voyage in and of itself. And there's about 20,000 Canadians who form part of this invasion force. And so they've been training, they know they're going to be taking part in an invasion, but the full news and full details aren't revealed until they're on board the ships themselves. At which point they start with additional preparations and last minute training and all the details of what the landings are going to, are going to be like. And they're part of um, a much larger invasion force, of course, some of which is sailing out of the United Kingdom, some of which will be sailing out of um, Allied held ports in North Africa. So all of this needs to be coordinated along with airborne forces um, and along with air support. So it's a very complicated um, operation. And additionally, in the last few days before the landings, as Canadian ships are going through the Mediterranean, which are still contested waters, both by Italian forces and German forces, the Canadians lose three transports to attacks by German submarines. And this is bad enough in that you're losing uh, the ships, you're losing personnel, you're losing equipment. But a lot of what gets lost is things like communications equipment um, and transport equipment. So all of a sudden, the Canadian Army loses communications equipment and loses a lot of the trucks it was going to be relying upon for logistics in the Sicilian campaign. George Kitching, who is with Simmons from Sicily through to Normandy, and um, Simmons sacks him in Normandy, wrote, wrote a memoir, and it's called like Blood and Green Fields or something like that. And there's a section where Kitching writes about the trip on the way out. They're doing staff exercises. And one of them is, what happens if we lose ships? And so they draw names of ships randomly. And they draw the, according to Kitching, and he's writing this decades later, um, they draw the names of the three ships that are actually sunk. And they say, well, we're going to lose all this motor transport. We're going to lose this. And, and essentially, according to Kitching, he's told, that's nonsense. That wouldn't happen. And lo and behold, a few days later, they lose those three ships over the course of a couple of days. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but that's how Kitching accounts it. And you can find it in his memoirs. And it's a really interesting little detail that people like to mention sometimes as, sometimes as a you know, plan for the worst. And um, in this case, they were planning for the worst. But And this has effects that carry on through the campaign itself. You have finite motor vehicle transport. What do you use it to transport? And ultimately, you have to use it to transport things like um, you know, things like rations, um, or, you know, munitions, things like that that can't transport themselves. Soldiers can transport themselves. <laughs> but they also wind up doing things like using mules as well. And that's partly because of the shortage of motor transport, but it's also because a lot of the roads in Sicily um, can be quite narrow and quite steep. In a lot of cases, they're basically hiking trails. Uh, so you wind up using mules because it's the best and most efficient way to transport personnel, equipment, munitions across uh, the Sicilian terrain. The Canadians uh, are landing in the far southeast corner of Sicily, so near the town of Pequino, alongside uh, the British forces and the American forces are landing further to the west, and all of this is unfolding uh, along the southern shore, essentially, of Sicily. There are a couple of challenges. One of them, first off, is that they've lost um, transport and other equipment, like we already mentioned. The other one is that there's an, not, uh, there's an incomplete knowledge of what the, uh, what the shoreline is like, but especially of things like undershore um, sandbanks and reefs and things like that. So in some cases, personnel are having to disembark from landing craft further offshore than they had planned. It's not a major problem, but it's still something that hadn't been fully anticipated, and it's a lesson that's brought forward for future amphibious landings. 
There are bigger problems for the Allied Airborne Forces because there are heavier than forecast winds. So a lot of the glider troops and a lot of the parachutists are dropped in locations where they weren't supposed to be dropped, including in some cases not even over land. And in other cases, they wind up flying over the invasion force and being engaged by anti-aircraft weapons. So mm -hmm. there are, it's overall a successful operation, but there are details, as with any military operation, that don't unfold according to plan. What are there like... Uh big challenges the Canadians had to overcome when they landed in Sicily? Well, a number of challenges have to do um, quite literally with the climate and terrain in Sicily itself. So they're landing in the middle of a Sicilian summer. So it is very hot, it can be very dry, very dusty. Uh, but also another ongoing risk in the Italian campaign as well is malaria and other insect transmitted diseases. So that's something else that has to be taken into account and that um, and it forms a major hazard, actually, for Canadian and Allied military personnel. So there's regular um, treatments of drugs to help try to prevent the transmission and or at least out malaria outbreaks. Um, but there's also just the considerations of what the climate's like, because it varies from very hot and dry in the summertime uh, to, as they discover on the Italian mainland, uh, to can be very wet and very cold as well uh, in the winter. Sicily is uh, mountainous in many areas and a lot of the fighting is to try to dislodge the Germans from defensive positions on high ground and uh, the Allies discover much the same thing in the Italian mainland as well is that the terrain lends itself very well to defense. Dr. Noakes, on a final note, um, no, I, uh, the title of our, of our series yeah. this year is the Dede Dodgers of Canada. Yes. All right, and can you tell us a little bit the anecdote how the nickname Dede Dodgers came to be? Oh, absolutely. So after the D-Day landings, um, the landings in Normandy in June of 1944, uh, there was an expression that got used essentially that the Allied personnel who were fighting in Italy had somehow managed to dodge or to avoid the fighting um, in Normandy. And so it's worth remembering a couple of things. The first is that news of the D-Day landings, landings in Normandy take, uh, breaks literally the day after news that Rome had been liberated. Uh, so the D-Day landings overshadow, to a certain degree, big news from the Italian campaign. And the soldiers in, uh, in Italy, when they heard this, of course, first of all, no one wants to be dismissed as you know, not doing their part, but they took it as something of a badge of honor, and they called themselves the D-Day Dodgers. And there becomes a very well-known song uh, to the tune of Lily Marlene about the D-Day Dodgers, which is partly a sense of camaraderie and a sense of identity, but is also pushing back against the people who originally used the term the D-Day Dodgers. So it's part of the identity of many of the soldiers who served there, and it's a song that's become very strongly associated with the Italian campaign. We are the D-Day Dodgers. The term, as you point out, is often associated with Lady Astor's comment, very dismissive comment, oh, you know, they're the D-Day Dodgers in Italy. Uh, and so for them, of course, it's, for anyone who's in Italy, of course, it's incredibly insulting after you've been there to, be, to have your contributions and your role in, after what anyone has gone through in combat uh, to have it dismissed as, oh, you're, you're avoiding the real fighting. So it's, of course, you know, very much a provocation towards them when they hear that. News. Well, thank you very much to, uh, to enlighten this part of the story because, you know, it's something that, again, uh, it needs to um, be understood oh. as we're doing this project this year. Well, you're welcome. It's, it's been great having you here at the War Museum to talk about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for drawing us the picture and, and to set the story for us uh, when we go to Sicily, actually, and, and, and land there like uh, that's going to be part of our next episode. And, um, thank you for your time today. I'd like to present you with the Brothers and Arms coin. Um, it's a coin that we designed you know, to, uh, to thank people for the time and your participation in our project. So uh, here's your brother's arms coin, and you're now you're a member of the family. Oh, thank you. I thank you to Yasmin and Jeff for inviting us to the Canadian War Museum and for relating to us this important part of our national history. And thank you for watching and for your interest in learning our history. In the next episode, we will bring you back to Sicily to relive 
the landing of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division and the 1st Canadian Armored Brigade as they land on a beach codenamed Park West. So stay tuned for more action to come. This is Roger. Till we meet again, Custos Memoria.